you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. Haunted houses always attract my attention, and my guest today has had the misfortune of finding himself living in two. Patrick Meachin's two books, Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street, cover both of these unusual, scary, and sometimes disturbing situations he found himself in. Patrick talks us through some of the events that surrounded him, his family, and his pets, and how he found himself facing two very different hauntings and the personal repercussions Holmes County had on him. Both books are available through Beyond the Fray Press, and a big thank you for Patrick for joining me on this week's show. As always, you can support the show by signing up to Patreon by clicking on the link, where you'll get access to early episode releases, ad-free episodes, and also our new Paranormal Archive series for Patreons only. $4 a month, and the link is in the show notes, as I said. You can find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and find our website at mysteriesandmonsters.com. As always, artwork for the show is by Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's join Patrick to peel back the curtain to show us that not all haunted houses are simply creaking doors and spooky sounds. On today's episode, I'm joined by author Patrick Meacham, author of Nightmare in Holmes County and The Haunting of 225th Street. Patrick's books focus on a series of disturbing and frightening events that placed him at the forefront of spiritual warfare. Patrick... I'm delighted to welcome you to Mysteries and Monsters. Thank you for joining me, sir. Thank you, Paul, for having me on. I'm honored to be on your program. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Patrick, I'm always interested when I see a book or I hear people speaking about personal experiences with a haunting or an infestation or paranormal activity occurring in a, in a property. Some people will probably raise eyebrows about bad luck. Um, for someone such as yourself to have the unfortunate situation of of seemingly finding yourself the owner of two afflicted properties. Um, (laughs) I think the the, the phrase would be jumping out of the frying pan into the fire, it would seem. That's fair. (laughs) I find it very interesting. When I've I've read the books, the one thing that, that struck me is that regardless of how difficult both situations seem to be for very different reasons as well, Patrick. Mm hmm. I find it remarkable that you managed to find the strength to keep moving forwards as best you could. And I know there are there are situations and times in, in both books where you, you feel as if you can't carry on and, and things are just getting on top of you. So for anybody that's not had the pleasure of, of reading the books, how on earth did all this start? And 20 years on now from, from Holmes County and, and the uh, the ground being broken there on this wonderful new property that you were going to move into... Yes. How how has it changed how you are 20 years on? Because it's the best part of half a lifetime for some people. Yeah, you know, um, wow. I guess one way I would say it's changed me is, and I think people who, who have experienced this will relate to what I'm going to say. Once your eyes have been opened to the spiritual realm, you cannot go back to how you were before. You can't go back to how people who have not experienced these things think. Um, you are in a completely different place. Um, you have a deeper understanding, I believe, of life, a deeper understanding of the, in my case, I believe, even the afterlife. So it it um, it changes you. You you kind of get to where you embrace, okay, this is truth. This is real. You know, people who experience this are not necessarily crazy. You know, if, if it's a legitimate haunting, if it's a legitimate uh, possession issue, that's not craziness that or, or insanity. It's real life. So I think one way that it has uh, changed me is, you you know, your eyes, my eyes are open. You know, my eyes are open to these things. My mind is open to it. I understand it. 
And I, I just see the world through that view now. Would you say, as that young, fresh-faced man <laughs> mm-hmm. that thought they'd got a wonderful property and, and the dream house that you would planned to be built there back in 2001, yep. Mm-hmm. Would you say at that point, obviously you're a, a, a deeply religious man as well, Patrick, and, and that's very clear from, from both your, your books. Yes. Often people will assume anybody that has a, a core strength in, in the belief of religion or regardless of which church or faith they follow. Mm-hmm. Would you say that what you knew in a religious sense prior to moving to Holmes County could even possibly prepare you for what happened or was it something that you'd heard about you maybe had, had come into contact slightly through your work in in the churches that you attended and changed you in regards to how much you actually believed in the parameters of what was possible you know i uh, i'm going to say that i my upbringing my but how i was taught how i was raised did prepare me uh, my experiences in life up to that point had prepared me. You know, I've had um, you know, there very well maybe future books that I will write about some of my experiences before that. You know, I, I am someone who had a uh, my father was murdered when I was a teenager. Mm. And there was a lot of spiritual things that went on along with that situation. That was that was something that really brought me into spiritual warfare. I did not totally understand all of it, though. I did not. I um. I always believed in the paranormal. I always did. When I was a kid, for some reason, um, we would go to the library. My dad would take us to the library about once a week, and we'd all pick out books to read. And for some reason, I always did read a lot of ghost books, you know, haunted house Mm. books. I read those kind of things. I don't know why. I was just always – I found it interesting. Um, So uh, I think I was prepared uh, as much as I could be. Uh, for what I was going to experience, um, you know, I had, you know, over the years even found some, you know, ministers who h- had dealt with exorcism and things like that. I always found that th- their stories fascinating. Hmm. I always believed what they were saying, but I knew that I would actually experience something like this myself. I, I came to a point where I had to just accept, okay, the only thing that makes sense here is all of those things are true. And I'm experiencing it now, and it's either that or I am crazy, you know, because uh, these things that I'm having happen are impossible, yet they are happening, you know. So I I do think I was prepared um, as much as one could be, but once you're actually in that experience, everything goes to a completely different level, you know, it, it, it just does. Now you're in the middle of it, now you're kind of thrown in the deep end, so to speak, and um, you have to deal with it. Yeah. Even with my upbringing, um, I had to go back and, and, and really the only way I found peace in anything was digging in the scriptures, um, you know, reading the Bible. What does it say? Because I need answers because this is going to destroy me if I don't get the answers I'm looking for. So it, it, it did cause me to go back in and, and reexamine things, you know. That I had, that I did believe, but look at the scriptures in a different, uh, from from a different perspective, and I think on a deeper level. Mm. And it that is the really the only place that I found any comfort, honestly. Like I said, you know, I, I have to say this, you know, when you actually go and you transition from the churchgoer, <laughs> who uh, you know loves to go to church, loves to take part in worship, maybe even play the guitar at church, things like that, mm. and you trans. From that guy to the person who's like, okay, this is more real than I ever knew, and demons are real, spiritual warfare is real. I'm going to be really honest. In in America, you are kind of now you're the uh, outcast in the church because a lot of the church is um, just wants to preach positive messages and not deal with spiritual warfare. So when you when you are embracing, okay, this is real. And, and, and this is something that is going on around all of us all the time. Um, you're kind of the outcast in a lot of churches, honestly. So that's something else you have to deal with. It's not a nice feeling, but you have to uh, you have to come to grips with it and basically just say, hey, in reality, my faith isn't in the church. My faith isn't in others. It's in God. And that's the only place I'm, I'm going to find any comfort. And I'm, that's the only place I'm going to find the strength and the authority and power to deal with what I had to deal with. 
Mm. I think there is an overriding theme through the through the early chapters of Nightmare in Holmes County, Patrick, where it, it seems very quickly that things take a wrong turn, um, even though it seems that the there, there are little things that are going on, and it, it's almost as if, and I, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, as as if you're either ignoring them or you're just brushing them off as just a new house settling down and things. And obviously you've got a situation with your, your marital situation at that time as well, where yes. there's a lot of tension. So having mm-hmm. been in a, in a similar situation as you found yourself in those early days in, in Holmes County, Patrick, I can kind of understand where you're coming from, where you're trying to make the best of a, of a bad situation, really. Yes. And I think it's... It's very interesting to me when I'm looking at this and, and, and seeing that you are a man who goes to church regularly, who, who reads the Bible, has a Bible on his coffee table in his front room. Mm-hmm. You certainly you know, are, are, are a proud Christian, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, my friend. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that for someone like me from looking at this from the outside, I find it remarkable that you seem to be, other than close friends and, and your family... You seem to have to deal with these situations extremely alone, as if it were, Uh, you know, other than you and the pets. It's it's basically like a a, a one-man army (laughs) (laughs) trying to deal with with the situation that you've got going on in the house, the situation going on in the neighborhood, the situation going on with the the social interactions of your neighbors. And it just strikes me as such a remarkably difficult amalgamation of problems all sort of coming to a head at once Patrick and I think it's it's incredible that you managed to find the strength regardless to mm-hmm. get through this and I think you refer to it a couple of times in, in, in those chapters about the fact that it's the, the strength you gain from, from the love of your animals that helps you get through these lonely dark periods where you, you feel as if nobody's taking you seriously. Yeah there's, there's no question about that you know I feel like uh you know, they, those each of those pets that I had at that time, they're uh, they've crossed the rainbow bridge, so to mm. speak. And they were, I, I believe, that every one of them was, you know, I, I feel like each one of them's purpose in life was to be mine. Mm. Each one of them's purpose in life to for me to provide for them, but for them to provide for me as well because they were there for me. Even my dog, Maggie, um, that, you know, she came to the property there in Holmes County as a stray. And uh, it sounds crazy, but I feel like, you know, when I look at the big picture, Maggie was put there for my good. She had she was a protector. That is who she was. And as soon as she was adopted into the family, which was like almost immediately when I found her, um, it was like she knew I'm here to protect and I, I feel it sounds crazy to say, but I, I feel that she had gifts. I think that she saw things spiritually. Um, and she, Maggie wasn't a, wasn't a, 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 an animal that was going to back down. <laughs> she, had, <laughs> she had kind of a, uh, a personality that was like, okay, well, I'm here to protect. And if there's going to be a fight, then so be it, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I think that she was just a, a, uh, a blessing. You know, there was a point where, she came down in the middle of this horrible situation. I find that Maggie has developed diabetes and she's very sick and she might die. And I remember the vet said, well, do you want to put her down? This is going to be really expensive to treat her. Do you want to put her down? And to me, it was like, I, I know he didn't mean any offense, but it was mm. a little bit offensive in that I was like, no, this is my daughter. You don't put your daughter down. This, You know, <laughs> it sounds crazy. But it was like, you know, every cent. And every bit of effort that it took to treat her so she had a, a normal lifespan was well worth it, you know. But, uh, you know, many and, and the animals were experiencing things in the house just as I did, you mm-hmm. know. Even some of the paranormal events involved them. In Nightmare in Holmes County, I had shared that, you know, there was a time when I, one of the first experiences in the house that I thought something is not right here I saw my cat Zoe come in the room. She was a little kitten. She came in, went to the food dish, started eating right after I put food in the dish. It was late at night. And uh, my wife had already retired for the evening. And uh, I saw Zoe come into the room, start eating. I looked right at her. I thought, how how cute. Hmm. I walked out of the room. She's still in there eating. I left the room, walked through the house, 
into the foyer. I turned to go upstairs, and Zoe was sitting on the top stair, the top step, just staring at me. <laughs> I thought that can't be true. This this can't be because she was in the you know in the mud room eating. How she can't be two places at once. And then I thought, well, she's clearly right here on the top step. So it must have been Moses that I saw my other cat, who was a big tabby cat. Mm. I convinced myself it must have been him that came into the room and ate. They looked nothing alike, but, you know, it had to be Moses. Yeah. So I go up the stairs, walk past Zoe, across the landing, open the bedroom door. There's Moses sleeping on the bed with my wife. <laughs> you know, it, it, this, the experience has even involved them. Mm. I would consider that to be a doppelganger. There were multiple experiences uh, like that um, involving doppelgangers while I lived there. Um, I believe one uh, likely was a doppelganger of me. Mm. And, and, you know, someone had claimed they had met me previously, you know, and all these things. I was wearing a white jacket. I answered the door, all these things. None of it. It never happened. But they were adamant that they had met me. They, you know, it was a delivery man, and mm-hmm. uh, so it was very strange. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the experiences did involve the pets, and uh, certainly I felt like they were there. Um, they were there for my good, for sure. Yeah, and I think it often gives credence to what a person's experiencing, Patrick, especially when you're on your own. Mm-hmm. That animals, and I'm a big believer in in animals' responsiveness to unusual events occurring mm. <laughs> and i'm sure yes. many of us that own animals will often remark on occasions where our cat or our dog is staring off strangely at some points of the room or is just what seemingly watch their little heads move around as they watch something walk past yes and i think most people will just brush that off but i think yourself and me are in that gang where <laughs> if if one of our pets head starts moving and looking at something we think right what are they looking at yeah <laughs> we know they can hear things that humans can't hear. Yep. We know they see things differently than we do. So I believe that they are, just from a natural perspective, I think they're more inclined to be able to hear things and see things hmm. that are, you know, humans are generally oblivious to. But I do think some animals are gifted as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, why not? You know, if they're sentient beings with with a range of senses that we can only dream of, why would they not be able to experience things on a different plane? For anybody that's not aware of your story, Patrick, how did you find yourself in Holmes County and what was it that that gave you the impression that this was going to be a fabulous new start in your life at that time? Okay, well, anyone who has visited Holmes County uh, and those in Europe are probably not familiar with this, but Holmes County, Ohio is the first or second, depending on who you talk to, really largest population of Amish in the world. Okay. So it is a, an, a, a county that has beautiful farmland. It's absolutely beautiful there. As far as people know, the Amish are very peace loving, passive people, hardworking people. They are very hardworking people. So, I found myself there because it was kind of a central location between where my wife worked and where I worked. And we had originally looked at a piece of land in Wayne County, Ohio. And our builder, I I came across this builder because he had built for a friend of mine that built a duplex. And uh, he came highly recommended. So, you know, I, I chose him as well. And he, when we looked at the land in Wayne County, he referred us to another piece of land that was in Holmes County. And we we looked at the land. We thought it was a beautiful piece of land, you know, and we fully expected, okay, he's going to do a great job building this house for us. And we're going to have a beautiful, peaceful property, you know, grounded by beauty. And uh, it will be happily ever after. That's what, that's what I thought. That's what she thought. As it turned out, um, it seemed like he changed once ground was broken and building began. He seemed like he became a complete, the builder seemed like he became a completely different person. And, you know, things started, you know, early on, there were little signs that by the time I got out of that situation, I had a completely different perspective on, by the time I got out of the situation, I had a completely different perspective on some of the early occurrences. 
and I believe that, okay, this, there was something to this all along, you know. Um, for instance, they broke ground in the beginning of the year, 2002. We bought the property um, in the fall of 2001. They, they broke ground and started building early 2002. In March, they, we received a phone call one Saturday evening from the builder, and he said, um, I have to tell you some bad news. And he said, I, I didn't have the heart to break this to your wife, so I'm calling you at work to tell you. He said, your house blew over. The entire house, it was built completely framed up, two stories, and a powerful storm came through the valley and demolished it. The, the house was completely flattened. And the builder kept saying, I have never seen anything like this. And, okay, we're, we're talking about an individual who was in his 60s. He was born Amish. He, he left the Amish religion, but he was very friendly with the Amish. He, you know, he subcontracted a lot of work to them. And so this is an individual that had been doing constructions for probably 50 some years because they start their, the young Amish start hard work, hard labor very early in life. Mm. And so when he's saying, I have never seen anything like this, that is, uh, that, that, that's interesting to say the least, you know. I, at that time, thought, well, it's bad luck, you know, just a, a bump in the road. We'll have everything fixed. Um, they, they hauled away. They tore up all the the uh, destroyed wood and everything. They hauled it away, uh, actually sold it to another individual, and they rebuilt everything. And I thought, well, you know, we, we put that behind us. Everything's going to be happy now. That was kind of an interesting experience. I, I believe now it was kind of an omen of things to come. Um, at one point, uh, while we were building, I stopped one day to check on the construction crew and see how things were going. And there was a very odd individual who worked for the construction crew. He lived on a high on a hill that oversaw the valley where the house was being built. Um, he, his parents were Amish. He was not, but he lived with them. And he, we, we, there was multiple things with him that were very strange. His behavior was very strange. But I stopped this one particular day, and he's sitting on his lunchbox in the garage. It's around lunchtime for them. And I'm talking to the builder, and this individual seems very shook up. He seems like something's really eating at him. Mm. And he says, um, there was a man here last night. So I'm thinking back, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, my you know, Chelsea, as I called her in the book, my, my wife had a friend and her new boyfriend stop to see how the house was coming along. That's all. He must be referring to that. Mm. And I said, you know, well, yeah, we had some friends and they, uh, you know, Chelsea was showing them the house. And he said, that's not what I'm talking about. He said, I had to take my car to the garage last night. And the road that we lived on was a shortcut between the road that his house was on and the next road over that, which was a state route where there was a garage where they worked on cars. And he said, I took my car to that garage. I took the shortcut down your road. And he said, when I came up on your house, he said, there was a man hiding in the bushes at the edge of your property, watching the house. And he said, he was very scary looking. He said, after I dropped my car off, he said, I took the long way home because I did not want to come down this road and see that guy again when I'm walking. He said, I didn't even want to see him again. So he, so he said, I took the long way home. Well, the interesting part about that, if he took the shortcut, it would have been a mile down my road to get back to the road where he lived. For him to have taken the long road, he probably went at least three miles because he had to take a big, long loop to come back onto the road that he lived on. So he's claiming that he saw someone that scared him so bad that he was willing to walk two, two to three miles out of his way um, to avoid seeing this individual again. At the time, I thought, well, I don't know. That, that's very strange. And I told him, I said, well, I have guns. If somebody comes around here and makes me or, or my wife feel threatened, they're getting shot, you know. And he uh, he seemed pretty shook up about that, too, which there was a reason for that. <laughs> but um, as I went through all the experiences I had over the years, you know, at the end of it all, I have to believe his story mm. there. I do believe that he saw something watching the house as it was being built. Um, I think it would be hypocritical to 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 not believe him at this point after all the things I experienced myself. So. 
you know, early on, there were just very strange things that you were like, I just kind of scratched my head like, man, that's, that's, that's weird. That's strange, but you know, whatever. And just Mm -hmm. tried to push it out of my mind. And eventually I had to come to grips with, there is something wrong here. There is something very wrong, but it was very deceptive. The haunting itself was because we were living in a new house. Everywhere you looked inside the house, you saw a bright, pretty new structure. You know, everything was new. The carpet was new. The walls we painted ourselves, they were all freshly painted. The cupboards, everything, everywhere you looked, you saw new, but yet there's something here that is not right. You know, um, in an older house, you might expect to have those you know, feelings of an, you know, being feeling uneasy or feeling like you're watched, something like that. But why would you experience, experience that in a new house? Mm. Um, while the house was being built, I would stop at night and work on woodwork. We did all the woodwork ourselves. We we stained it. We varnished it, everything ourselves. So, you know, I was there at, at, late at night in, in a unfamiliar uh, area in this house that, you know, is still being built. And I'm in there alone, and I always felt like someone was watching me. Mm. It was a very uneasy feeling, and I couldn't shake the feeling, so I started bringing a uh, a radio, a portable radio, and playing worship music, like playing Christian music, and um, you know, just focusing on that, and you know, pro- it probably drowned it out noises and whatnot too, you know, when I'm listening to a radio. But that was how I kind of dealt with those feelings. Was you know, um, I tried to distract myself and refocus my thinking on to worship instead of uh, being creeped out, so to speak. <laughs> yes, yeah, and. Do you think, looking back, Patrick, because what what strikes me is that a lot of people that come into contact with the property or or the local area itself seem to act very strange, or people seem to think that the people are acting as they know them. Do you do you find that interesting, looking back, in the fact that you seem to be in the middle of this maelstrom that's going on around you and obviously the situation with your your wife at the time and the some of the people that done work on the house and their personalities and how their demeanors changed yes do you think that and i and i know you touch on this later on in the book that there's there's a lot of speculation in regards to as you refer to how can a new house be haunted well mm-hmm. clearly the ground can be haunted exactly this seems to be one of those situations where a plot of land, when you look back at it, I suspect, Patrick, you may, you may disagree. There was a reason nobody had built a house on this plot of land. And I think that when they started construction, and I know you, as I say, you refer to this in the book, when they broke the ground, did something come out? I believe that there was a curse on that land that was already in place. And I do believe that when they started building, it just opened everything wide open. Mm. Um, I believe that, you know, e- even years later, I-, I ran into the builder's son, who also was part of the construction crew, and he told me, he said, I think we unearthed something when we started digging there. As it turned out, you know, that was a piece of land where American Indians had encamped, you know, centuries earlier. And we know there were battles fought there. We know there were people killed there. Um, the Amish neighbors even did confirm that to me. They said, there's no question about it. And they said, there's ar- arrowheads everywhere out here. Like in the, in, at that time, the Indians would use flint to make arrowheads and they would make arrows for hunting or for battle. Hmm. And there was a lot of arrowheads out there in that area as well. So... I think yes when we when we started building I think that um it it just opened the doors wide open to uh the paranormal to the the spirits that I believe were already there and uh you know it took me all the way in from 2002 until the end of 2009 before I found out the whole story with the property you know and there were times I walked the property in the time in, you know, after we moved in, even before the divorce, after the divorce, you know, when I was there alone, I would walk the property and pray and, you know, try to anoint the property and take authority and all this. But I never knew specifically what the root problem was. I never knew. Hmm. So I never addressed the root problem. I never, I, I didn't know enough to. So, 
you know, there were curses in place that I had to specifically uh, deal with by name, and I didn't even know they were there at that time. So it took me all the way until the fall of 2009 to understand what was going on and what I needed to do. Uh, During that time, there were many, many experiences. Um, I share in the book, you know, there were times, there were times I, uh, the only way I slept was laying on my back with a Bible on my chest open because I just (laughs) felt like uh, it it was such an uneasy feeling, you know, and the things I would experience, uh, you know, and I, I, I saw, you know, black masses pass right through the house. I saw them. My cat saw them. They reacted to them. You know, I, I at one point I was look. I looked at the window. It is a, a, approximately one o'clock in the morning, and I'm at the kitchen sink. And uh, I look at the window, and it's pitch black outside. It's light inside. And when I saw my reflection, I saw a black like I'm going to say it was like a shadow person. It was a black sh- shadow over my left shoulder. And when I saw it, it disappeared in a downward motion. It knew I saw it and it disappeared. Hmm. You know, these are just some of the experiences. I had many. And uh, the other thing a lot of people don't really think about, you know, with haunted locations, it's not just that you have the terrifying experiences where you are completely caught off guard and it really just unnerves you and, and, and scares you. It's not just that. You are oppressed in that environment as well. And they want the spirits that are, that are there. And, and in, in my cases, I've dealt with demonic hauntings. And they impose their hopelessness on you. They, they want to destroy you. They hate mankind because we are created in God's image and they hate God. So, And they know that they are not redeemable. Human beings are redeemable. Demons are not. They're fallen angels. They've their their fate is sealed, so they want to take as many of us with them. They're sore losers, so to speak, and they just want to take every human being they can with them. So you know, in that environment, they impose very negative feelings on you. You know, um, they, they want to bring you to the bottom. And so, in my case, I was dealing with all that. I was dealing with. I went through a divorce that I you know was not my something I ever wanted to experience. Mm. And it, it, you know, as, as I've called it, it was the perfect storm. I'm dealing with hauntings and paranormal activity that are actually coming from a couple different sources. And then on top of that, I'm going through what in anyone would consider emotional trauma, you know, of a divorce, you know? Yeah. So it was, it was a very difficult situation. I'll touch briefly on, you know, I said there were multiple sources for the haunting. You know, there was an issue with the land. But one of the most shocking things that I think people don't want to believe about that experience was that the Amish, and I'm not saying this is all Amish people, but it is some Amish people, are heavily involved into the occult. And they practice witchcraft. They practice, you know, different forms of what they call powwow, which is a form of witchcraft. That is a mixture of American Indian witchcraft with old world witchcraft from Germany and the places where the Amish's ancestors came from. Mm-hmm. And they, which is, I, I would say, like a combination of, you know, a little bit of so called white magic and some dark magic, whatever. Mm-hmm. But then a lot of them, that, that in and of itself is dangerous. But then a lot of them will go into, you know, Ancient books, I think they're called the sixth and seventh books of Moses. They're from a time period, you know, thousands of years ago in Mesopotamia where they, it was full on conjuring demons. And, uh, they, they, the teaching from those books is not that Moses was a servant of God and Moses, you know, parted the Red Sea because God, God did it for him, you know, and, you know, he threw his staff on the ground and it turned into a snake, uh, because, God caused that to happen to tell, you know, to let the Pharaoh know to let his people go. They believe that, no, this wasn't acts of God. This was Moses was a magician. And, you know, there, there's this whole uh, belief system based around that. And a lot of the Amish are into that. Mm. And they're also into Satanism. And when they want what you have, unfortunately, if they're practice, practicers of uh, or practitioners of the occult, they're going to curse you. They're going to put you know, spells against you. And I was dealing with a lot of that as well. I know that sounds crazy. So I, I did include evidence in, in the book mm-hmm. 
of, you know, multiple meeting sites that I found where they were practicing Satanism and witchcraft and these things. And I have photo evidence in there of these things because I realize when you when you say something like that, a lot of people are going to scrutinize what you have to say. Mm. So I did include a lot of proof. Yeah. I think the other aspect of all this is when when you're trying to do with these varying factions, because as you say, the thing that makes your story remarkable, Patrick, is that it isn't like a typical haunted house. There's no kind of terrifying apparitions and bangings and crashings and smashings. It it seems rather sneaky and malicious. Yes. I know you refer to it at the beginning that um, you, you get your eyes tested because you, you keep seeing things out of the corner of your eyes. And as you refer to the pets, keep watching things moving around. Yes. Things keep breaking or being moved around the house. There's nothing overly aggressive going on it just seems very spiteful if that makes sense yes i i believe that what their goal was to was to get me to take myself out mm. and it was because of my beliefs that i was able to stand against that mm. but i do believe that i think that brings them great joy if a demon can have joy in any way it would be to get a person to get to the point that they're so distraught that they take their own life mm. And I felt many times in that environment, I felt like I knew this is what you want and it's not going to happen, but this is what you want me to do. That is why you are relentless in the torment, you know. So I, I feel like what was there, that was its goal, was for me to destroy myself. And it was a very different haunting than what I experienced at 225th Street. Mm. The the two places, they were very different. The, and, and again, the root cause of the hauntings in each case was very different. Mm. So uh, I do think, yeah, definitely, it was like it was very sneaky. Um, it just did things sometimes just to mess with you mm. because... You know, when you can't get rid of it, it's intimidating. It's very frustrating. You know, you're, uh, you know, and that, in, at that point, I was trying to sell the house after the divorce, and I, you know, the market crashes, so that's not helpful at all. No. And then while I'm trying to sell, I'm dealing with that, and I'm dealing with the paranormal, and I can't get it to stop. I mean, it's, uh, it's very discouraging. It really makes you question. In my case, like I was pretty open about it. I, I did question my faith at times. Um, I was fortunate in that, you know, even on my worst day, when I laid my head down to sleep at night, I came back to the truth of, okay, I got nothing. If I kick God out of my life, I got nothing. Yeah. I, 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 I can't beat this on my own. You know, and I would have to ask for forgiveness and, and just keep praying, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, you know, something I, I dealt with sometimes. I'm not proud of that, but it, it, it's kind of... Uh, being truthful about what I was experiencing. Mm. But uh, it, it was a very different haunting than 225th Street. I think that's an interesting aspect of, of that struggle that you're going through in, in in your Holmes County book as well, because I was quite taken with that, because you are very honest about, you, you seem to be really struggling to find a home for your faith throughout this period as well, Patrick, and you, you seem to have some frustrations, and I think you are annoyed about the lack of support or or the fact that, you know, here you are, a practicing Christian, a man who's, as, as we've said earlier, is, is very proud of his faith. Mm -hmm. And yet it seemed as if you were talking about magic and myth when you tried to, to, to talk about these things to people where people would be very surprised to find that it, it seemed as if you were talking about things that had no no place in, in religion, which is very difficult for to understand, really, because if you have... A, a person such as yourself, Patrick, who is, is reaching out for help and support and, and spiritual guidance through this period. I think the general consensus is that people will fall over themselves to help you. And yet there's a crucial part, I think, sort of around 2006, 2007, where you're really struggling to get anybody to really take you seriously other than your family. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, that was very, very frustrating. And you know what I go back to is... Um, the reality is, I think the Christian life is, it's very dynamic. I think it is exciting, even when you're struggling, because there's so much, something so much bigger than me going on. There's a bigger plan in the middle of all this. It's bigger than me, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm involved in it because I'm called to be involved in it. And there's a, there's actually a plan why I have to go through this. Yeah. And what, and, and, and I end up, I believe I found out why, you know, but, um, 
it is very uh, it's very discouraging when you're you can't find the help. And, you know, what I would go back to, though, because what I would present to you know different pastors and people I reached out to, I think some of them wanted to help and they didn't know what to do. So they, they probably were like, yeah, I'm going to pray for this guy. And they did. But they nobody really wanted to come and do spiritual warfare. Hmm. And I think they did question, well, the seminary I attended, this this is just craziness. This stuff doesn't happen anymore. Yes. And there's people who said that. Well, this doesn't happen anymore. But I go back to this. The Great Commission, this is the last thing Jesus tells the disciples before he ascends into heaven. This is after his death, burial, resurrection, and then he ascends into heaven. And his, he's given final instructions before he, he ascends to heaven. Hmm. And he says... This is in uh, the book of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verse 17, is where this starts. And he says, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who believe not shall be damned. And then he says, um, these signs shall follow those who believe. The first sign he gives, they shall cast out devils in my name. Okay. This is the Great Commission. This is what Christians are supposed to be doing. Yet, when you talk, when you go to the church and you're like, hey, I, there's something going on in my house, you know, I, I don't know what to do, and there's, you know, there's activity I can't explain, they should be like, okay, yeah, you, I'm going to go cast out that devil because, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> that's what the Great Commission told me to do, you know, and they they don't have that perspective anymore. There's a very different perspective that is about entertaining people in the church and making them happy and things like that. And it's like you're missing the Great Commission. To me, I, I, I cannot escape that. I cannot escape all the passages where Jesus cast out devils, where he told the disciples to cast out devils. It, it, it's commonplace, and I believe that is to be in the life of Christians in this day and age, he never said, a matter of fact, he actually said in another passage, he said, when he's talking about the Great Commission and, and, and all the things that the believers are to do, he said, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. Hmm. So if he's with us, who are we to be saying, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe in that. You know, it, it, it's like the church has lost its way. And I'm not saying that in a condemning manner. It's it's just it, I believe it is true, and um, it it puts a lot of people such as myself into a, a bad situation because it's uh, it's very hard to get the help that you need. Yeah, I do I do believe that I experienced all that for a reason. I believe that it was through those things I studied and come to understand spiritual warfare on a different level and understand um, basically how the warfare works, you know, that understanding our enemy. You know, you don't really hear in church today, pastors talk about the devil very much. And if they do, it's like he's just some abstract being that, you know, whatever, he's out there somewhere or whatever. But no, it's it's not like that. He's actively involved in our world on a daily basis. He has legions of fallen angels, which are devils or demons that work under his hierarchy. They are they work in rank in order under his authority and they have a common goal. And if we don't understand that and we're not willing to fight against that, then we've missed our we've missed the mark and we've lost our way. Hmm. Hmm. I know, as you've referred to and you touched on it a couple of times there, Patrick, do you think that the situation at Holmes County Without wishing to sound churlish, do you think it was you were destined to go through this struggle to end up gaining the knowledge that you've gained, or perhaps to prepare you for what came next <laughs> after Holmes County, perhaps? And the fact that through what you've learned, the knowledge you've gained through both your own personal research and your own personal experiences has allowed you to benefit others more than you could possibly have considered 20 years ago. Yes, I do. I do believe that. I believe there was a purpose for it. I don't on my own. I would never have chosen those experiences yes. because they were they were not nice to go through. They were very difficult. Mm. But I do believe there was a bigger purpose. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to sound overly religious, but the Bible does say what the devil means for evil or for bad. God will use for good. And I believe that um, I did uh, experience those situations 
to learn on a different level how to deal with these things mm. and then to share my story. Mm. You know, many times I questioned is, you know, if you, you read Nightmare in Holmes County, I questioned many times, when is this going to end? Why, why am I going through this? You know, yeah. and it came to me not terribly long ago. I was thinking about that and I thought, man, it, I wonder why I, it took so long to go through that situation. And it was like, I believe that the Holy Spirit revealed this to me because I'd never, I'd never thought of it like this before. But what came to me was you had to go through that um, because and you, it took that long because your next assignment was 225th Street hmm. and everything had to fall into place for you to go to 225th Street. Yeah. So I do believe that, you know, those things happened for a reason. Now, having said that, <laughs> I believe every single person on earth, there's a plan for their life. There's something that they are to do, and they're specifically equipped to do it. They're specifically called to do it. I do believe that. So when I say I do feel like I was put through that for a reason, I want to be very clear that that doesn't make me, you know, oh, I wrote some books, now I'm better than somebody. I'm not. 100% I am not. Hmm. I That is just what I was called to do. And there's a lot of people that are called to things that – um maybe are somewhat lower profile or something like that. Yeah. But they are e uniquely equipped to carry out those uh, assignments. Hmm. And I believe literally every person has a calling. It's just a lot of people never realize it. Yeah. Well, often a lot of people fight against what gives them enjoyment or what they may have a talent in because it's it's not the normal thing to be done or it's not seen as as fitting in patrick and i think a lot of people have a lot of problems by the fact that a lot of people just don't want to stand out they don't want to be different they don't want to do things that seem unusual or weird shall we say yes to the general people um you know as someone that talks to people from around the world about a variety of strange things, Patrick. I can assure you that um, sometimes people will ask me what I'm doing on a on an evening or whatever, and I'll say, "Oh, I'm, I'm interviewing somebody about such and such," and they you can see you can see them shake their heads, <laughs> yeah. yes, and they think, "Well, eh, I'm going to be watching television," but it's what gives me joy, and and I'm very humbled that people seem to enjoy the conversations that I have with people around the world about a variety of subjects. And yet, as you refer to there, it took me a very long time to embrace the person I actually was. And I think mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with you that if you'd have told me 10 years ago what we're doing now, I'd have laughed in your face. Yeah. Though most people would say I could always talk the hind legs off a donkey. <laughs> I was just going to say, you are gifted to do these interviews. You are gifted, you, you know, everything, you know, you know, your way of thinking, your way of communicating there, you have a gift. So I believe that's, that is the case. I, and, and, and I get it. You know, sometimes we don't want to, or we, we may resist it because it's not the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think the other aspect of all this is that, I mean, the one thing that, that is quite positive as well is, in, especially in the first book, is the fact that when you go, get through this, eventually, you know, and I'm not, don't want to spoil the book, you know, that mm -hmm. there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's, it's very yes. interesting that it, it takes a sort of the support of a, of a network of people to come forward and, and one of them kind of identifies what's going on. Yes. Which is very interesting as well. And it seems that that seems to be at that, from that point on, the catalyst for your life. To, because, you know, as, as we've said, you've, you've gone through this, tumultuous eight nine year period patrick a relationship breakdown the fact that you you brought these these animals into your life that seem to just appear from nowhere copper is another one that's found yep. stranded you know just yes. sat there bless it but, but when i'm reading about this I'm, my heart's melting thinking who could as you say who could do this to an animal and and you know good on you for for taking these these creatures in and, and giving them the love that they reciprocated to yourself obviously throughout this period Yes. So it's it's interesting that, that it, it seems that you have to go right to the bottom of your very soul in regards to how you can cope with this and deal with this and constantly keep trying to get up every day, knowing that all this weird thing, on top of the problems you've got in the area with your neighbours, the problems you've got with the property itself, the fact that your your marriage had 
had collapsed and fallen apart and there were issues there and you'd got other things going on and the testing of your faith throughout this time and it's almost as if you were drifting along desperately trying to reach out to grab hold of something and eventually it, it, it all seems as though everything seems to just turn on itself very quickly Patrick does that how it seems to you looking back because I would yes. imagine that the first eight and a half years seem to probably last a hundred and then the last yep. six months probably feel like they lasted a week <laughs> It, it, it when they when the, the deliverance happened, it was very quick. It, it I believe there was a series of things that all played together. That you know, looking back, I think it's very clear. You know, I went through a period of I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast for a couple of days or a day and a half or whatever. Which I don't fast. Um, I uh, I don't like <laughs> feeling hungry. I don't like getting low blood sugar. I don't fast. A lot of Christians fast all the time. I mm -hmm. I, te I technically I don't. Yeah. But this, in this instance, I felt very desperate, so I did it. I believe that there were things that happened in the spiritual realm when I did that that started the ball rolling in my favor. And then I, I happened, you know, I, 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 I was faithful in some things I felt God called me to do. I'm sorry, they are somewhat controversial, but um, that I, I supported ministries and things like that, that I felt that God was testing me and saying, will you, will you trust me? Mm. And I did do that, you know, and then he certainly put people in my life like very quickly that were willing to help yeah. and that had information that I desperately needed. So when it all came down, you know, we did the so-called exorcism on the property within 60 days of that, I was moved. The house yeah. sold, the, the, the sale had closed. I, I moved. Okay. All the activity in the house stopped after the day that we did the exorcism. So I, I would have to be crazy to think that those two things did not, you know, the house selling and then the exorcism were not related. I believe wholeheartedly that they were. The house had been on the market two years and 10 months by the time it sold with no luck, no chance of it selling. Mm. And once I found out the whole secret of the land and the property and everything, and we did an exorcism, everything turned around almost overnight. So I do believe, yes, they were, it, it, it did happen very quickly and it was all, uh, it was all related to actually going out and practicing spiritual warfare. Yeah. I can, uh, I can imagine the relief you must have felt because obviously you also, the other aspect of all this is you have to move out pretty quickly. It's done and dusted and, and gone, which is another one of those things, Patrick, when we look at what happens yeah. next, which is obviously 225th Street. Once again, we're looking at coincidence or destiny or whatever. And as you yes. say, you know, you've had an eight year audition, <laughs> perhaps, yes. Um, yes. Uh, for, uh, you know, one of the longest job interviews you could possibly imagine, I would say, Patrick, for what comes next. So when you see this property, this red bricked beautiful property that you mentioned often people will say well you can get a feeling about a property but like you say when you you know when you got the the house built in in Holmes County it was only when things started to go wrong that you perhaps suspected that something wasn't quite right there whereas yes. this one your, your first impression is once again oh I've dropped on here this is lovely yes <laughs> you know I, I really thought that I th you know I saw uh, the people that bought my house in Holmes County did not give me very much time to get out. They wanted me out quick, and um, I moved on very quickly. I found a house in a small town in Tuscarawas County, Ohio, and I never, I never disclose where the town is in the book, just out of respect to the people there now. But mm -hmm. I find this house, and it's got a very large fenced-in yard. It's got a huge detached garage. You could put park RVs in, or you know, it's very large garage. Mm -hmm. It's got another detached garage at the back of the lot. So it's got a lot going for it, you know, and it's a, a big brick house built in the 1920s. So I move in and I'm thinking, okay, my nightmare is over. And you know what? I'm going to write a book about my last experience in that house. And I'm going to call it Nightmare in Holmes County. You know, I had this all planned out. Yeah. And my first night at 225th Street, I didn't even have my bedroom set up. So I'm, I'm in a spare bedroom and I'm laying on the floor and I'm looking at this closet and I'm and, and just looking at the woodwork of the closet. And all of a sudden, it was like I heard a voice inside my head say, you don't know anything about the history of this house. And then I thought to myself, that's true. I don't know anything about the history of this house. So I said a 
spiritual warfare prayer, similar to how I learned to pray in Holmes County. Hmm. But I was not specific about anything. I knew nothing about the history of the house. So I said just a very generic prayer and went to sleep. Over the next, you know, days, few days into a week to two weeks, I began to have experiences that I just couldn't put my finger on. And I kept thinking, okay, there's no way this house is haunted. There is no way in the world it's haunted. I can't have two haunted houses in a row. That would be crazy. That's impossible. (laughs) And I knew nothing followed me. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people ask me, well, how do you know something didn't just follow you from Holmes County? I know it didn't because the... Victory in Holmes County was very decisive. It was over. That nightmare was over and I moved. And, you know, as I start to have these experiences at 225th Street, you know, I did say to my mom one day, and I said to one of my cousins too, I said, if I didn't know better, I would think something followed me from Holmes County. Hmm. I actually said that. I said, like, something's not right here. And I would have experiences early on, like one night I was putting on my shoes to go out and uh, take care of Maggie and Copper, my dogs. And... My mom had been there earlier helping me unpack and get the house ready and all that. And she left. And I'm standing in the living room right by the stairs. And I'm putting on my shoes to go outside. And the front door slams. And I'm like, how did that happen? That door was shut. What? You know, that's weird. And I just kind of wrote it off, but I thought it was strange. So then one night I came home from work. I believe this was on March 1st, 2010. Hmm. I came home from work. I went up to my bedroom. And I opened the door and my bed was sitting at an angle different than the way I had left it. So I thought, well, that's weird. I didn't have my bed sitting like that. So I I convinced myself, well, my cousin is an electrician and he has been, you know, done some odd jobs around the house for me. You know, Hmm. he came into this when I first moved in, he went into that bedroom and put in a satellite TV outlet and he did that right away. But I thought to myself, he must have come up here and checked his work or checked something. So for some reason, he moved my bed and I'll ask him about it tomorrow. I'm sure that's all that happened. <laughs> so I straighten the bed and we you know when it's time to go to sleep, I, I get in bed and I shut my eyes and it was like a vision. I had a vision that I, it wasn't like I was laying in my bed anymore. I was standing outside the bedroom door and I was looking down the staircase. And I could see a hooded figure coming up the staircase and I could see its face. It looked like a thin old man. He looked like he was dead, like the complexion of a person in a casket. Mm -hmm. He had a sinister grin on his face. He was somewhat, uh, he walked with like a slouch. He had like a somewhat round shouldered. He was coming up the stairs and he was like glancing down and he had a a, a creepy grin on his face. And I opened my eyes and I thought, what in the world? You know, I'm not scared. I'm I'm sure my cousin moved my bed when he was here working today. (laughs) Where'd that come from? You know, I shut my eyes again and there it is again. You know, I open my eyes and I'm like, I'm not scared. You know, where's this, where's this, this image in my mind coming from? You know, so this, this happened three to four times. So I said a, a spiritual warfare prayer. You know, I knew no details about the history of the house and, but I said a spiritual warfare prayer. And I shut my eyes. I didn't have the vision anymore. And I went to sleep. Hmm. I told four people of that experience. And I'm glad I did <laughs> because it was proof. <laughs> but I told I told my mom. I told my best friend. I told the girl I was dating and her oldest son about that. And I said, each person that I told, I said, I'm sure there's nothing to this. But this is what happened. And then I would say, you know, there's no way this house is haunted. It can't be. Well, My neighbor came over a few days later and he introduced himself and this was on a Saturday and uh, seemed like a really nice guy. He he just introduced himself and then he left. The following day is a Sunday uh, late in in the afternoon and my mom and my sister and my brother-in-law stopped to see me and we're standing out on the porch talking and my neighbor comes back and he's got his girlfriend with him and he comes over and he he basically tells me, hey, you are welcome in this town. If you need any help with anything, we all help each other. If you need something, you tell us and we'll be there for you, you know. Mm. So I said, OK, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's the good news. Now for the bad news. And I knew what he was going to say. And I looked <laughs> at him and I said, you're going to tell me my house is haunted. 
And his eyes got big, his mouth dropped open, and he said, yeah, man, some dude killed himself in your basement a long time ago. Yeah, your house is haunted. And uh, I turned around and I looked at my mom and I said, I told you, because, you know, I I had told her I had this bad feeling, you know, there can't be anything in this house. This house can't be haunted, but something's not right here, you know. If I didn't know any better, I would think it's haunted, you know. So I looked at her and I said, I told you, and she's like, you did. And then my sister's like, oh, no, not again. What What's he talking about, you know? And my mom says, he told me he thought that something was going on. So my, my uh, neighbor's like, well, hey, I got to get home. You know, I'll tell you more later. So at <laughs> <Yes>. that moment, <laughs> Thanks I that. knew. Yeah, yeah he, 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 he was good at that. He would start <laughs> get you right on the edge of your seat. Hey, I got to get home. And, you know, my kid needs me or whatever, and he would leave. <laughs> Come back later and tell me the rest of the story, you know. (laughs) But um, I knew at that moment I am to write a book about this house, and I am to write this book first. Yep. The title is to be 225th Street, and Nightmare in Holmes County is going to be released later as a prequel. So that is how these books were released originally. Mm. 225th Street was released in 2011. In 2015, um, Nightmare in Holmes County was released as a prequel to 225th Street. And then in 2020, in the fall, uh, Shannon from Beyond the Fray Publishing contacted me. And she said, you know, would you be interested in uh, Beyond the Fray Publishing republishing your books? And I said, yes, I would be interested, but I have a lot more information since the time that I wrote those books, if I'm going to republish them, I think I need to rewrite them Mm. and include all this additional information. And she said, absolutely. So I went back, I rewrote, you know, a lot of it I was rewritten because, you know, with 225th Street, it's not only all the additional information because the haunting has continued over, you know, over the years since 2011, activity has continued. Mm. But you know, there were stacks of notes that I had from 2010 and 2011 when I originally wrote, you know, the book that there were details that I never knew were relevant. Yeah. I thought they were interesting. So I wrote them down when I interviewed people. But now, you know, in 2020 and tw- early 2021, I realized some of these details are actually significant and they, you know, they're they're a major part of this haunting and they need to be included. So I went back and I rewrote, you know, a lot of it with the new, uh, the the information I had then, but I didn't know was relevant. So it gives a more complete picture of the whole haunting of, you know, what has happened as that haunting has continued. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, my experience is there originally, I was there for three months and it was a very long three months. You, you know, I uh, <laughs> most evenings to go to sleep, I laid on my back with my eyes wide open, staring, you know, looking around the room until I got so tired. I just, you know, went under <laughs> because it was not a place where you got cozy and went to sleep because there was too, you were always worried about what's going to happen when I'm sleeping. Am I going to wake up and see something? You know, what's going to happen next? So it was not a pleasant uh, time when I lived there. I have a lot of experiences that were in the original book. And now I believe, you know, they, there's even more detail on a lot of the history of uh, 225th Street. And there's a lot of details that, you know, like I said, I had originally, but I didn't know were relevant. And uh, the story is horrific. I'm not going to lie. It is. It, and I will tell you, you know, people talk about, you know, a lot of times people want to dabble in the uh paranormal and dabble in haunted houses, I think you have to be very careful because I believe as I've proven in the uh, second edition of 225th Street, these things can become matters of life and death. Hmm. You know, you could die because of being in that environment. You know, you are basically at the mercy of a something that does not understand mercy Hmm. and wants nothing to do with mercy. And there are people who died while they lived there. There are people who died after they lived there, when they when they moved, very strange deaths, horrific accidents that keep reoccurring with different people. But the accidents have very similar uh, characteristics. You know, the details are very similar. Mm. And uh, the the activity in the house, it's it's um it's unnerving, to say the least. When I rewrote uh, 225th Street and, and wrote the second edition, you know, 
again, I like to write late at night. That's just my personality. That's when my mind focuses. But I was revisiting a lot of that as I'm writing it. And it, it was very uncomfortable. Mm. You know, when I'm, I, I did my homework. I went back and, you know, some of these people that died strange deaths, I got it, it, as much as I could. I got every detail. I even got their autopsy reports or, you know, their death certificates. I, I, I scoured uh, newspaper articles to find out, you know, I want to connect all these dots. I want to I want to tell the complete story as much as I possibly can hmm. and and connect, you know, these 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 situations are related to the house and they are similar to the other accidents or deaths of other people who live there. So I definitely did my homework. But, you know, you're looking at, you know, I'm sitting up late at night and I'm going over even death certificates and autopsy reports. And I'm thinking, my goodness, what a horrible ending to this person's life. And I do fully believe it's related to that house. Mm. It's It's unsettling. Yeah. I mean, that is the other aspect of this is, I suppose, when you peel back the curtain on something like that, Patrick, it can be deeply disturbing. It is. It is very much deeply disturbing. Um, again, I do feel that, you know, when I experienced 225th Street, I, you know, I befriended people who used to live in that house. There was one old woman. Her name in the book is Patricia. And and I became very good friends with her. And, and, and uh, you know, she's passed away now. But uh, she was an older lady that had lived there before me. And we became very close because we had experienced a lot of the same things. Mm. You know, so it was like there was a friendship there that we could relate so much to our each other's experiences. We became very good friends, very uh, you know, I, I could rely on her. Hey, I'm going through this situation or that situation. Will you pray for me? And she would do that with me. We would, you know, talk and, and share prayer requests, pray for each other. We always knew we had the other ones back. Yeah. But she suffered greatly while she lived there. She lost loved ones. And, and she fully believed the things she experienced and, and the deaths, the deaths of her loved ones related directly back to that house. Mm. So I, I, uh, I'll share a couple little just very odd things that, you know, in the original edition of 225th Street, I mentioned that when I first moved in at night, I would be, you know, going around checking all my doors before I went to bed, making sure everything was locked up. And I would be in my living room and I would start to go to the staircase to go upstairs to go to bed. And I would feel like somebody was watching me. And I would stop and I would look across the living room and I would always think this reminds me of what it would be like to be in a funeral home in the middle of the night. You know, it's closed, it's after hours and you're in a funeral home alone. <laughs> and I would always think that. Yeah. And I and I even wrote in the first edition, you know, I I don't know why I experienced that exactly, you know. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure, but I always experienced that. As I dug deeper with the second edition, you know, I had mentioned earlier that there was a suicide in that house. And as you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had that experience of the hooded figure on the staircase in, on what I believe was March 1st, 2010. As I found out, March 1st, 1958, the guy who built the house went to the root cellar and shot himself. <laughs> so I believe that was a big part of the haunting of that house is there's a suicide there. Mm -hmm. But as I found out, there, there was there was more to it than that. And interestingly enough, in my research for the second edition, you know, I found uh, an older person who lives in that town. And she was uh, very, very kind to speak to me about what she knew and things, even just details she knew about the town. She lived there when that suicide happened in 1958. You know, she knew things that, you know, I wasn't going to find out elsewhere. Yeah. But one of the things she told me, and I looked into all this and it was true. You know, it was very strange that I would always feel like I was in a funeral home. Well, as it turned out, in 1958, the ambulance service was not run by like a fire department or a hospital or something like that. The ambulance services were provided by the funeral home. Yeah. So this individual shoots himself in the head in the basement, March 1st, 1958. The details are very strange. The family assumes, yep, he's dead. He shot himself. He's dead. They called the sheriff. The sheriff deputy arrives. He takes their word for it. Yep, he's dead. All right. He calls the coroner. The coroner shows up. He goes down to the basement and says, he's not dead. He's still alive. we got to get him to the hospital. So they call the funeral home. The funeral home employees come into the house, take the, the uh, suicide victim from the basement, 
put him in a hearse, rushed him to the hospital where he later died. You know, I really believe that, you know, the whole, all the details of that situation are very strange. The family yes. <laughs> assumes he's dead, Yeah. you know, didn't thoroughly check, left him lay down there. He laid on the floor from 930 in the morning until around noon oh. before he ever got to the hospital. That's very strange. Yeah. And uh, there's other details that are even more unnerving, you know, that I included in the book. There's a lot of things I uncovered that are just they paint a very different picture mm-hmm. of the whole situation than what I was able to paint in the first edition. But I believe I was actually discerning that many years later the involvement the funeral home had the day of the suicide in the house. Yeah. You know, why would I keep feeling like I was in a funeral home? And then I find out that the funeral home is who sent the people to take him from the basement, put him in a hearse and rush him to the hospital. It's a very strange coincidence, we'll mm-hmm. say. Yes. But uh, many, many details um, I uncovered, even about the individual who killed himself. I believe he was a very a demonized individual. There was a lot going on with him. I think he had some very bad issues going on. And I think that house has a lot of dark secrets that contributed to the suicide and then also contrib- contribute to the haunting, as I think, obviously, the suicide does as well. Mm. But uh, it was very, uh, very uncomfortable researching and writing to 25th Street, although I do find it very interesting. And I, it, you kind of get into a mode when you're writing where it's a bit of an obsession and you have to keep digging. You have to solve this. You have to share the story. Hmm. But it was very uh, some of the details are uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, they are two disturbing and yet thoroughly addictive books that you've released especially as you refer to the updated versions which give you a a much deeper picture on on both situations and both properties where can everybody keep up to date with them and get hold of a copy of them well you could go to beyond the fray publishing.com or you can actually order them um, just on amazon you can go on amazon you can get a paperback edition um, or you can download a kindle version i have People have contacted me from United Kingdom and, and Ireland even who have uh, read the books, you know, the new the new editions. So they are available in Europe. They're available in the United States. Just about everywhere you can you can access Amazon, the books are available. But um, Eli, like I said, if you want more information, uh, you can go to beyondthefraypublishing.com and uh, there's more information there as well. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure I put links so everybody can track down a copy in the show notes. And where can everybody keep up to date with yourself, Patrick? And what's next for you? You can find me on Facebook, just Patrick Meekin. Last name is spelled M-E-E-C-H-A-N. I try to respond to friend requests pretty pretty quickly. As far as next for me, I'm going to, uh, I, I really have the desire to make a, like a docudrama of 225th Street, some sort of a movie documenting that story. Mm-hmm. I believe it'll probably need to be in multiple parts because as that book shows, <laughs> as is, is documented in the book, the haunting goes on for decades. Each family that has lived in that house are horrific. They're very interesting. So I think it would take multiple parts, but there's a there's a lot of info information there. But um, I would love to do that. I, I plan on doing that. And I just uh, got a contract also. There's going to be another book. Um, I plan on writing multiple additional books as well, but there's going to be one that uh, I just received the contract for for yesterday. Uh, It's going to be called uh, Shadows and Light, Mm -hmm. and it's going to to document five demonic hauntings. One of those does have some roots in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Uh, It will document the haunting of John Wesley's house. John Wesley was a very well-known evangelist, probably the greatest since the Apostle Paul, in all honesty, in history. And he was uh, most he was in the United States, some, but he was, most of his preaching happened in England. Yeah. And there he was involved in a lot of spiritual warfare. And there was a haunting of his residence that I will be including in this book. I've always find, found it fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it is. a It is a very interesting case, that one. I must admit, I am aware of that, Patrick. So I, I look forward to your uh, your take on it and, and bringing that to light, because it is one of those stories, I think, that because of its age, I think it's often overlooked. But yeah, that's a very creepy tale. It, it is very much so. Like when I read it uh, from his own journal and, you know, it's all in his his way of talking and yes. everything. <laughs> it's like you can picture it as you can picture it happening as a movie even, you know. Yeah. But it, it's horrific. It is. But I have 
I have multiple stories I will be sharing in that book. It'll be uh, probably released later this year called Shadows and Light. There is um, exclusive information about a haunting in my hometown with uh, photographs that are mind boggling. Mm. And uh, again, I have I've uh, obtained rights to that story and the photographic evidence. I will be sharing that in the in the book and multiple other cases as well. So that that'll be in the future. Um, but again, right now, Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street Second Editions, I think it will uh, <laughs> keep people interested for the time being. Again, both stories are completely true. Uh, the only thing that's been changed is the names, and that's just out of respect to those people who yeah. you know were involved. Absolutely. Well, yeah, they'll certainly keep people going. They might keep people up as well at night, Patrick. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, if if if, <laughs> if you're afraid of a creepy story just before bed, I would recommend reading both of them in the day. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, Patrick, thank you for your time. It's been lovely to have a, a, a conversation about both both of your works. Fascinating, <laughs> disturbing, very creepy. But also, it's very good to see what's happened and how you've come through these challenging situations in the positive way that you have. So thank you for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure being on your program, and thank you so much for having me.